Today, we'll be having our interviews typically last an hour for each of the candidates so that we're able to ask a wide range of questions very relevant for that seat. And I'd like to remind all of the viewers that uh, for the county council seats, you can vote for all the county council members, all nine seats. So that means that it's not uh, district uh, prohibitive. It, it is countywide for the county council. And for the state representatives, they are specific districts then that we have listed and we have the interviews then for those representatives uh, running for those offices for those districts. So again, uh, we will begin our interview process uh, and Sean Lester will begin uh, with Shane Sanansi and uh, go ahead, Sean, take it from here. And make sure to put everyone else, everyone else have their uh, mic on mute. Thank you. Aloha Kako, nice to see you. Aloha Shane. Hey, aloha uh, na kupuna, na makua, na opio, na kamiki o keia inane. Aloha. Aloha. So Shane, it's nice to see you today. Are you, you're held up in Hana? Or are you in town? We're in town. We were here for some meetings. Okay. Um, kind of, so the first question I have, this is your first cycle that you are an elected representative on the county council. In a minute or so, could you tell me what you feel that you is your is the is the the one thing that is really focused that you feel like you've done in the last 18 months? Say, you know, one or two of the things that you're really focused on that you feel good about. Uh, thank you, Sean, for that question. Um, as you know, I'm the Environmental Agriculture and Cultural Preservation Committee Chair. And so they thought that I would be the best candidate for that, being that um, also from East Maui, um, the environment and, and as a cultural practitioner. Um, so some of the things that we've done in, in the committee this year is um, we just passed the Bill 52 restricting the, the uh, use of uh, plastic foodware, single-use plastic foodware. Um, that was a great, right, uh, for the community. Um, to address uh, beach ocean pollution. And we also, you know, one of the um, cultural issues that has been is uh, the uh, burial site. So we've, um, it's great to, we just heard that we proposed a position, in the, uh, uh, the mayor's office to hire an archeologist. So they just hired Janet Six. Oh, or, wow. Or, to be the archeologist. I hope I didn't spill the beans, but. She's amazing. Um, but we've been we've been working hard to to get a um, a Coney archaeologist just to address the shortfalls uh, at the state level with with Chippy. Brilliant. As uh, thank you for that because I I know Janet personally and I've worked with her before and she's extraordinary. So thank you for that. So with what's coming up now, what do you see in a minute or so that that in your next next phase over the next six to nine months that you see is the main focus that you want to to focus on as a council member uh well uh the uh, the staff has been working diligently and hard on creating a department of agriculture so oh, wow. uh we're hoping to get that on the ballot in november um it's it's uh it's it's coming up. It's a it's going to be a tough sell only because, you know, of of how things have been running in the last couple of years. But as you know, just looking at this uh, pandemic, and um, we realized that putting all of our eggs in in one basket um, in the visitor industry is, you know, is definitely not the way to go. So so we're looking to diversify our economy, and. You know, if anything, we're going to address those, uh, have that conversations about agriculture. Um, we're an agriculture community historically, so uh, we want to get back. Uh, there was a there was a time in history that when Huli switched to ninety percent imports and and buying all of our produce, our uh, our meat, everything off off island. So. So looking at going back and looking at those historical events that happened that switched. And so, um, and then of course, you know, agriculture 
you know, we, we need to subsidize it. You can't just get farmlands, you know, from a from a bank loan or, or anything like that. So we need to uh, look at uh, funding, um, creating those processing centers, uh, inspectors, ag inspectors. All of these things are going to be part of this. We're hoping to. It's going to be uh, big work, a lot of work, but we're hoping that everybody can quickly jump on board and support our efforts. Great. I appreciate that. One of the questions I have is, can you tell me a bit about the uh, the CARES Act? And because uh, I know it's the county council's job to disperse all the money in it. So in so many months so the, in co with COVID related issues, if you don't disperse the money, Maui County loses it. Do you have a plan for that, Shane? Can you, you elucidate on that a little bit? Uh, right now it's in the mayor's office and he's um, he's put together a, a, a plan uh, to put maybe 40% of it into getting it to the, the people, um, another 18 million towards um, training and addressing those emergency uh, workers, um, uh, police, firemen, training those types of uh, – and then there's some other things that he's planning. But for us, I, I think – you know, we're looking to get those funds directly to the people. Um, mm -hmm. If we can get, you know, right now there's there's the help uh, program that he does, but it doesn't, uh, you have to go through a process to get it. And for us, I think if we can just like stimulus checks kind of, you know, really boost the economy by getting out uh, the money quickly that uh, to families in need, um, that'll quickly get us back on board. So um, we're supportive of that. Great, thank you very much. And Sylvia, you're next. I'd like to pass it on to Sylvia. Or, or Aloha, Bruce. Shane. Thank you for coming. Aloha, Sylvia. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering what was the the biggest lesson you had in your first term in office? What what kind of learning curve? I imagine it must have been quite steep. Yes, it was uh, coming from the Department of Education and right into this political arena, um, definitely from teacher to student in a in a second. So um, I'm I'm grateful that um, I had a, a great staff um, um, that helped me along. Um, I've never read this much material ever, even as a teacher. Um, it's just the, the volume of work that you need to. Uh, just to get on board really quickly with. So uh, getting my staff to help um, the other, the other members that we, you know, ran alongside, they were very helpful as well. And of course, you know, the su support from uh, our constituents like yourselves um, definitely put us on the right path early and we just holomua and stayed, you know, stayed the course. So, um, Thank you. Thank you for all your hard work. And um, now that you are an incumbent, how are you finding um, your ability to stay in touch with your community and your constituents now that you're sucked into your um, job in Wailuku, I assume, many days? Um, how's it going staying in touch? And, and also during the lockdown, how is it going um, staying in touch with your constituents and keeping abreast of what's happening in your community uh yep we've uh we tried to get home every weekend um and you know just be part of the community go to church on the weekends that sort of thing um be visible you're right we haven't been um out and about lately with this uh, stay at home order so um a lot of this kind of stuff social media i probably have about three or four social media pages that we get our work out the budget we've been busy with the budget um so um definitely but calling all of our uh constituents in hana uh, as far as our nonprofits, make sure that they're uh they've got the um the funding to operate and uh, and work with our uh, the students the children um in the community so uh, through the budget, we've been able to really go out and make sure that everyone has uh, enough funding to operate. 
Thank you for that, Shane. And uh, one more thing is, um, how can uh, we support uh, the people like you in the council who are working towards a uh, Department of Agriculture? Um, you're wanting to get it on the ballot and you said it's gonna be a tough sell. So um, as far as uh, we staying in touch with you, uh, what can people do who are interested in um, making sure that we do get funding for agriculture and uh, that that becomes a top priority of the council? Right. As you know, um, you know just the work getting me here, uh, we pinch ourselves every day um, that we're in the position that we're at to make, to make uh, influence change. And uh, change comes, doesn't come easily. Uh, people are used to, to how the things operate here. So um, people need to be constantly be reminded on, on what the needs of the community. Some people are okay with it. And, and here, when you're dealing with, um, I don't want to say, but special interests sometimes, you know, we'll always have a larger, uh, uh, you know, the, on, on some of our um, government officials. So just being able, it's, it hasn't been an easy task. It's, it's been scrapping along the way and, and, and not kind of, you know, not giving up, but you can't, politics will continue as, as we go to sleep. So we still need to, uh, we still need to keep at it and stay on it because if we don't, we've seen, you know, it can quickly sway um, um, in another direction that that is, is totally could potentially detrimental to to our people. Thank you, Sean. Well, thanks for keeping up the effort, and I'll pass it on to the next interview questioner. Okay, Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Bruce, I think you're next. Okay. Greetings. Hi, Shane. Hello, Bruce. Um. So the big topic for people this year is uh, recovering from uh, this uh, COVID thing. I'll put no other adjectives on it. Um, what are your plans for kickstarting the economy that's so uh, dependent on tourism? And, and what do you see as the way to take care of this situation? You, you blacked out a little bit, Bruce, on that, so you need to repeat that question. Yes, uh, Shane, um, uh, what, um, what do you see as the best ways to deal with re getting the uh, uh, economy back going again with such a tourist-based economy here? What are your plans and ideas, and, and what do you want to see happen? for this this pandemic is kind of sometimes it's a sort of a blessing and a curse right um but it's it's pretty much put the brakes on everything right i mean we're not having um the the, the multiple airlines flying uh, the world has come to a standstill hardly any pollution no flushes thousands of flushes each day at our visitor industry um, the reefs are coming back, fresh water, the air is cleaning up. And so the earth's kind of have had this time to just to breathe, right? And so um, for those of us who, who enjoy that, being in nature and being in, in her elements, you know, sometimes going back to uh, is, is going to be is tough for us. But but they're ready. They're already at the door wanting, wanting back in. So I think... Um, it's uh i'm hoping that not that it lasts fair we still need to address the economy and then put people back to work however um if we can you know what a great opportunity to to address some of our shortfalls to fund those areas where we need to fund um get rid of things that hasn't been working for us and promote new ideas and, and new people and, and put, put, you know, uh, we've, we're a technologically advanced, more advanced now. So we're hoping to look at those, those industries um, 
that can help sustain us. Um, we do have the ESG, um, the environment, good governance, um, um, and sustainable um, investments. So, so we're hoping to look at um, how our maybe our pension funds can and start to invest in more sustainable, you know, things like our environment uh, into farming farmlands. So. Um, I'm definitely supportive of our um, our ESG efforts. Thank you. Um, I was pleased to see the charter amendment for for county manager has been put before the voters. So, uh, what are your feelings about district voting charter amendment? Uh, either the nine equal sections or the three. Uh, three districts following the senatorial districts with three members each. What is your feelings on that? Right. That's a, that's a, a tough question. Um, I've gone back to my community and asked them about it. And, you know, even though that we have to go campaign in all nine districts, you know, we still have a seat from HANA. I think if we, you know, we don't have the numbers to support uh, you know, like the senatorial races, if we go to a canoe district format that we lose, we could potentially lose our um, uh, opportunity to, to have local representation. We could have Lanai o Molokai representing East Maui, like the current senatorial races. So um, although my community supported me 83% in the last election, um, I'm hoping that that, you know, uh, goes through uh, through all the other districts where I, where I definitely the majority of, of votes will come from. And uh, one more district uh, a charter amendment to uh, have term limits to remove the word consecutive from the term limits. Briefly, do you support sure. that? Yeah, I'm supportive. Um, I think we need new ideas, new people in there, new new blood. Um, uh, make those changes um, as we, you know, progress, evolve. Um, so I'm definitely supportive. Okay. And with that, I will pass it on to the next person. Uh, Tommy, are you ready? You need to unmute yourself. Mm. There you go. You're unmuted, I'll, Tommy. Good. Okay. How, how about now? You, you got it. Hi, Shane. Aloha, Tommy. Nice seeing you. Nice seeing you. Um, appreciate your time today and your candidness with the previous folks asking your questions. Um, a few people kind of got close to it, and I felt like you almost wanted to answer it at one point. Um, when we talk about your first term here, and all the good work that you're doing and all the good intentions that you have and, um, you know, all of the, the wishes of people that you're representing, right? And when you talk about playing politics and you talk about, you know, um, you know politics doesn't sleep, right? Um, you know, you, you go to sleep and politics still going. Any specific examples where you had you know, frustration, just major challenges on just something that seems sensible, just sensible things that you're just like, what is this kind of a thing? I, th those are the, the, the things I'm interested in here where you were just kind of neck slapped, like what, why, why, why is this, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, um, the main one is, um, you know, just the leadership change mid uh, midterm. You know, that was something that I didn't even fathom that that could happen but you know that was a quick show to the chin to say hey you know and that's you know if you don't keep on top of things you know um things can definitely um change and move direction like uh, like how it did and and that was a that was a learning experience how how that could all you know come to fruition um there was, and, and I only bring that up because I think it took um, different factions for something like that to happen. It, it's not something that we can address in one meeting. I think it kind of, 
it had to evolve. And, and so that's why I'm saying that I was, you know, dumbfounded that, that it did happen. So, um, um, but it, uh, like I said, it was a learning experience and, and now it's the time to, you know, uh, a lot of our constituents, I got calls saying, Hey, I, you know, we voted for you. We thought, you know, this was going to happen, but, um, it's like, I didn't know what to tell them that, you know, things like this happen on the council. Do you feel, uh, you, you get penalized for supporting the losing faction in that case? Um, maybe, maybe somewhat a little bit. Um, yeah. I think we've well, been, I mean, you, 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 know, you, you didn't jump over and play game. You didn't, you, you know, you stayed yeah, loyal, so, right? Yeah, then, no, no. Well, we've been, you know, we've been staying the course. Um, and so I think if we, you know, helping to speak uh, to to the issues and, and staying on course um, definitely helps. Um, you know, you guys coming in and providing testimony has been great. You know, I mean, the more people hear, the more the other members hear your testimony and what's passionate about our communities. I mean, it definitely helps. It helps my situation when when speaking to issues and, and when voting on, on issues. So I appreciate all of the testimony. Nice. That's all I have for you, Shane. Appreciate uh, the good work you're doing. Thanks, bro. Uh, Daniel, uh, why don't you go next? Hello, Shane. Hello, Good Daniel. You, yes. Thanks for all the work you've been doing over there. I know it's a whole new world, as you said, going from Department of Ed to Councilman. So I have this question for you. As a public representative, it is a duty to face the truth and to act righteously. These islands reflect the lowest voter turnout in the United States. On May 15th, 2019, Dr. David Keanu Sai gave a presentation to the Maui County Council, evidencing the illegal overthrow of Queen Liliuokalani in 1893 and showing clear violation of domestic and international law with the ongoing illegal United States military occupation of the Kingdom of the Hawaiian Islands. As a candidate for public representation, how do you rectify handling the truth of Dr. Sai's presentation as well as the works of the Kohavai Pai Aina office in Hilo, Keamoku Kapu, Henry Noah, Amelia Gora, Pompikana Hele, Leon Su, Dr. Desaius, Madame Ruth Bolome, etc. How do you rectify the compliance of the law in restoration of occupied lands? Uh, thanks for the question, Daniel. Um, you know, I think that's why uh, Member Paulton invited Dr. Sai. Uh, several of, of us, especially new council uh, members asked for 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 that very question and of course we've been prompted by jennifer ruggles um a letter at the uh, uh, hawaii county council um you know she was she was just asking if she had her being uh, participating in local government was violating any um, um i guess if there was any challenges um out there uh with the Kingdom of Hawaii and the state of Hawaii. So would she be in violation of those? And so I think that's why um, uh, Member Paulton invited him and he, he came three times to, to do his uh, talks. Um, he was very informative. He kind of laid it out in a, in a historical timeline. He highlighted um, the process. He, um, you know, whether, um, um, how Native Hawaiians were acculturated into a, an American system. That process, he um, he looked at the the UN and um, ad addressing the legality of you know the transfer uh, the national transfer. Um, for me, what I took out of it was um, you, you know because that question was really bothersome of us where we. You know, I, I don't know if you were a traitor to to a, a nation, but um, I think what he came up with was um, what I took out of his uh, talk was that, you know, uh, the county councils back in 1908 were uh, uh, created in a in opposition of a strong central uh, government uh, on Oahu. I think there were uh, 
appointing the governors. So a lot of the Aloha Aina uh, groups from from all the different communities, they sort of uh, started up the county council. So the county councils, local county councils was formed by local native peoples that were, you know, uh, pushing back on the strong central government at the, um, uh, on Oahu. So I think, um, and, and Dr. Sai's, uh, he just recommended that if we wanted to address that, maybe we could come up with a with a county organ um, ordinance that you know if if so if the Hawaiian kingdom uh, uh, it was uh, the illegal overthrow was legal or not, you would still have to. And if we were being occupied, uh, uh, we would still have to run a government. Um, and serve our constituents. So, uh, you know, you could, you could still have a government despite, you know, having all of these other issues uh, being asked. So um, I think that's, that was one of the main things that I, that I got out of Dr. Sai's talk. Hey, mahalo Shane. I'm gonna come back, uh, come back to you and pass it to the next questioner. Mahalo. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Robin Knox, uh, you'll be next. Jane, thank you for coming uh, to talk with us today. Don't um, talk. Don't talk, Don't ask me anything environmental because you're the pro. The pro <laughs> at it. <laughs> well, you know I am. <laughs> yeah. so I, I have I'll call questions. you for the answers. <laughs> I have two questions. One, um, as a member of the council, and as the the lead of the environmental committee, you had you were privy to a lot of information, um, more than all of us in the public could hear. And so I'm just wondering, for those who don't know, there was this historic case where um, local nonprofits alleged that the County of Maui wastewater treatment plants required a national pollutant discharge elimination system permit in order to discharge to the ocean because uh, that permit would be more protective of the ocean. And it went to the Supreme Court and we've got a decision now. And I'm just wondering what your insights are into how you think this might um, affect how Maui County um, manages their wastewater with or without the requirement for a permit. Yeah, you know, I supported uh, the vote to just settle the case and fix the problem. Um, so I was, you know, I was one of those um, uh, that supported not to go to the uh, Supreme Court uh, in for fear of it uh, screwing us with the Clean Water Act. Um, and and I only did so too is because. Um, uh, the administration had put upwards of 14 million to fixing the problem while putting in some some additional uh, um, wastewater piping and moving it uh, up into the fields and using it as, as R1 for agriculture water. So I so I wasn't sure on why we were still asking for more clarification from the Supreme Court. We've already I think the county lost that the, you know, the local courts, the Hawaii Supreme Court, the Ninth District Court, the, the Supreme Court, and now we're going back for an appeals at the um, Ninth District Court. So for me, it's just that we've spent a lot of time and money, you know, taxpayer money, mind you, you know, we're hiring special counsels to represent us at all of these, you know, these court proceedings. And so I think, um, you know, when, when we've already funded uh, the efforts to, to fix the problem. So um, I, um, we're looking at what happens next, but you were very helpful in my decision making, especially the fact that, you know, the states have that right to, to write our own um, uh, policies. And which could be even stronger than, you know, other states or, or even the federal government. So I was very supportive of, of doing that where, where we, could, we could do our, you know, fix it ourselves. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad to know that it does help when I show up and testify. Um, 
as as a person who is an expert in pollution control, water pollution specifically, um, I know that if we want to improve ocean water quality, we have to reduce the pounds per day of pollution going out to the ocean. And reuse can do that by taking it, you know, not directly into the ocean, but some of that pollution might still get into the ocean. And Reuse, as you well know, 14 million is a drop in the bucket for what's needed to get a lot of pounds per day of pollution out of those injection wells. Um, it can cost less just to do treatment. But what's interesting to me is the effect of this COVID virus, because now we have like a great opportunity to see uh, immediately our pounds per day dropped because like you said earlier, all those thousands of flushes or about 30,000 flushes a day or whatever that aren't happening. Um, it's reduced the wastewater flow so much that I heard the Lahaina treatment plant shut down half their units. Um, so I would like to know how, as we bring tourism back in, how can we make sure, you know, we wouldn't need more treatment plants or bigger treatment plants to get better water quality if we weren't treating all the sewage from the tourists. How can we make tourism pay for their share of that infrastructure? Right, and um, I've heard about taxing flushes, you know, where you're paying paying for that as you, as um, to our visitor industry, that was one issue. Um, you know, we, we spoke with Dr. Pang. Dr. Pang is looking at some alternatives using more organic ways of, but I think that's more at a, at a smaller scale and maybe dealing with our residential uh, sewage treatment. But um, as far as the, well, we definitely have to put a moratorium on hotels until we can figure it out. I mean, if we're, if we, if we haven't figured this one out and if we're building five more hotels on the island, um, you know, we're not, we're not helping the situation. So, um, I'm, I'm for looking at alternatives, um, and looking at, we, we've had some other people from other island nations that may be dealing with as well. So I would look at it and, you know, and seek advice from, you know, people like yourself, um, on, and, uh, at a municipal scale, how can we deal with our waste? So I'm open. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think it's is it my turn again? I think so, or is it you, Paul? So you got a you got a turn. Okay, you're not just moderator. You can talk to us. That's right. Uh, Sean, um, aloha. I have two questions about utilities. Uh, the first one has to do with the lifeblood of the island, our water. Um, would you support the county asserting eminent domain over the EMI system in order to administer the public trust water resource for the food security necessary for our community? Um, I guess in a nutshell, yes. Um, it'll be a process. You know, we would have to go look at those those lands that are state lands, county lands, or lands that uh, that are owned by the um, um, EMI, um, and then maybe start with uh, getting all the um, uh, uh, doing all the um, what you call appraisals of all of these all these lands. Um, as far as I mean, I don't know if it would be considered a taking, but, um, you know, one of the issues was why isn't uh, the county, especially the issue of upcountry using the water from East Maui, why isn't the county actually uh, applying for the lease? Uh, uh, I think a lot of the, um, uh, the questions is, you know, why is an, uh, a foreign entity uh, in charge of our public utility, our public resource. So um, I'm all for it. I'm looking forward to working with our uh, Sierra Club and other uh, to maybe looking at creating a, a water board authority 
um, and start looking into that. We we definitely got the uh, the TIG report from the uh, the Water Commission. Um, that's a great start as far as looking at appraisals and looking at um, um, if we can't eminent domain, maybe purchasing portions or all of the system. Um, uh, they've already punched the numbers. Uh, you know, we're selling it at five cents a gallon. Other places, a dollar a gallon. Um, so, as far as funds go, um, it's very doable uh, according to the report. So, um, uh, I'm looking forward to working with community agencies and and addressing that that issue. That would be one of our uh, our committee's next. Uh, work moving to to looking at that um, acquisition of East Maui water great uh, thank you for that uh, Shane I guess uh, you know when we look at it in terms of how crucial water is in terms of our overall development where developments occur or won't occur also in terms of what types of crops we want to raise to have a foreign entity be in charge of that when really when we look at our uh, constitution, it is really the rights of the people to own that, and they do own that. And, and again, and there are questions about how that was taken away. Are there any legal cases at this point in time looking at that eminent domain or looking at the um, takeover and I guess the operation of our water system, its access and distribution by A and B and now EMI and now my Pono? Uh, I don't know of any of off the top of my head, but um, you know, looking into that, and um, I, I think already uh, going through the the EIS was that was kind of a a joke. Um, you know, we had the actual applicants um, doing the EIS, so um, I think that was kind of um, it, uh, questionable that. Um, they hired their own people to do the EIS and, and there, there was a lot of things that wasn't addressed in the, the EIS for, uh, for the, the permitting of the system. So um, I think maybe utilizing that as a venue to, to go after, uh, to promote uh, or, or just to protect our water resources. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sean. I have one more question about our electricity, our utility. Uh, since Maori residents pay the highest electric rates in the nation based on uh, the uh, electric being provided by a private corporation, Miko, and Kauai pays the lowest rates in the nation based on the electric being provided by a community cooperative, what are your thoughts about owned and operated cooperative? Uh, I'm supportive, definitely supportive. I did see um, uh, some of the the audit um, where there's, you know, now that we've, we're getting a lot of outside uh, companies, alternative energy companies, and with the 2025 mandate for the state to alternative energies, we're seeing a lot of these projects coming through. Make, I think uh, Mako just came out with one or two RF or showing where there's some discrepancy Great, thank you for that. Uh, Sean, I believe you're next. Great, thank you. First minute I'm gonna spend with a couple or three things. Number one, um, our utility was just swallowed up by the large utility on Oahu, which makes it more difficult to work with. That's one thing. Number two, pre-pono days, uh, pre-pono, uh, uh, my pono days, uh, when the, the water issue came up, I did a deep in-depth research regarding the actual owners of A and B 
found out there wasn't a single large, what's called a large stockholder in the entire state of Hawaii. Over 85% of them were basically um, uh, companies that were corporations were known as sharks. They were short term, you know, and, that, and a huge number of them were international. So before we start spinning off into a whole bunch of things, we have to understand in the first place, A and B is an international corporation owned by international people. It is not a local corporation. So uh, at least with my opponent, we kind of know who the guys are. But with A and B, you don't understand the number of profound um, sharks in the water. So that's a real challenge there. Um, Gosh, there was one. Oh, and I wanted, and I, and I, and with that as a segue, I want to turn it around a little bit. The um, the fourteen million dollars we've been talking about, you know, which the mayor has squandered of our money, chasing something that makes no sense whatsoever. Let's throw a couple of million dollars more in regarding uh, uh, wasted time and energy in the mayor's department and other places and whatever. So let's take fifth. Let's just take fifteen million dollars. We now have a pandemic. We're looking at a massive decrease in, 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 our, in our inflow of, of funds. We're looking at a massive increase in our, in our um, uh, unemployment. When you look at all those numbers right now, you just went through budget. If you were handed $15 million to help take care of the COVID and take care of our people that wasted money, that wasted money, if it was here right now with you in the budget, what would you do with those burned dollars that this administration threw away on a ridiculous thing that they just did? What would you do with that money? Uh, if you had 15 million. Uh, well, 2 million would de definitely go to every one of our residents uh, just to, you know, boost the economy and get it straight to, uh, to our uh, residents um, on the island. Um, that's just two million right there. Um, we put a list together um, uh, for uh, smaller remote areas like ourselves. We're beefing up on our emergency preparedness. Um, of course, you know, efforts have been put into addressing our unsheltered. Um, I would put more money into picking up some mobile units for our unsheltered, maybe more uh, mobile units and urgent care. Now that some of our um, our medical or hospitals are one of our you know uh, high spot areas, you know maybe looking to have uh, uh, urgent care areas throughout the island um, uh, for preparation and of course putting more money into agriculture and um, uh, like the small grants micro grants that we're putting for food production. I mean we've definitely. This has been a, a an eye opener um, that food for us to feed ourselves, especially our our families, our communities here, um, in anticipation of any shipping lanes that are either shut down. Um, we need to first and foremost take care of ourselves, our health, public safety, um, and and feeding ourselves. So. Uh, which, which, you know, which, uh, if this thing all goes through, if we put the infrastructure in now, you know, we could be creating a uh, an export economy um, using, you know, using our food farms. Um, uh, but we definitely processing centers um, uh, to process our, our food here on the on the island. Well, okay, refrigeration. So it, it sounds like that $50 million, when you look at the force multiplier of being able to give that out here locally, they're probably close to 30 to $40 million of true value were wasted by the Victorino, by, by the Victorino administration and this ridiculous you know, chasing of, um, of, of, of injection wells. So that's straight out of my pocket, out of every single person's pocket here, and all of your constituents that were wasted by Mayor Victorino, and we need it today to pay our rent, to do other things with. So I just want to want to say it from that side. Thank you for dealing with my soapbox. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I don't know how much times you got to lose um, and, and keep paying. So uh, it just boggles me. It does because it, it, I think it's we're reaching a point where every dollar is going to make a difference. And uh, do you feel that the time that you've spent 
over this last 18 months, you're, you're catching up. This is gonna be your second time that you've had a chance to do budget. So that's a very strong thing. We're losing uh, Ricky Hokama, who's been decades and decades of working with that. Do you feel like that's one of your, one of the strong things that you walk into this election cycle with is the ability to say that you've got two of those under your belt and you know, from that side, could you speak to that a little bit? We only have about a minute or so. Yeah, if anything that I've learned from from Ricky is, you know, holding the state accountable when it comes to shared responsibilities. Um, so um, he's been here upwards of twenty years. So um, I've, you know, I I give him an ear every time he, you know, he speaks. But um, uh, yeah, we're gonna. Uh, but Kiani's been a she's been a great um, alternative. She's on her way, and. Um, you know, she, she amazes me the way she can, you know, the way she controls such a huge budget. And so uh, she's definitely um, uh, been the source of inspiration for, for myself when going through these budgets. Okay, thank you very much. And for that, I'm going to pass uh, it on. Yep, Bruce, why don't you go next? And uh, then after that, we'll have Tommy. Yes, Saloha Shane. Um, what would you say, what is your solutions for our unsheltered homeless population issue here in Maui County? Yeah, I, I always thought, Bruce, that we should go ahead and inventory. Um, and, and I don't know if it's, you know, legal to do that, but just to, you know, uh, our unsheltered has many different reasons for being out there. Uh, by themselves, so I think, um, and we've we've had some of this discussion lately. Um, um, uh, the department has worked with some private agencies and sending uh, unsheltered people from the mainland that are here and have no place to go. They've kind of worked on that, but um, just having that connection, looking at those seeking families or resources out there that uh, that are looking for their family or that, that can support their family. Um, and then definitely finding out where the, um, the largest need is, whether it be mental health services, food, um, and then funding those specific areas. I mean, once we get that inventory, then we can start putting our resources uh, towards helping our unsheltered population. But um, again, this this pandemic has kind of uh, slowed things down where we can, we should be focusing on, on the least of our communities, our unsheltered. And in that same vein, what are your solutions, plans, ideas for the uh, uh, drug epidemic, both um, uh, uh, well, primarily ice on this island. Right. My community is no stranger to uh, drug abuse, substance addiction. Um, it's in my family. Um, uh, it's, it's, now it's not just addressing um, uh, 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 the addicts. It's now affected families uh, all the way through our kupuna that now have to raise a second set, a second generation of children uh, because we've got parents that are um, addicted to drugs. So uh, my my response is to make sure that our family unit unit is not affected, that we have that the children are spared while. Um, So Shane, uh, you are uh, have a, a a signal there that we're not getting through. So, go ahead, keep on talking. Uh, now using their retirement to help uh, raise um, these um, these children. So, um, I think uh, in addition to addressing the, the issue, maybe making sure that everyone else who is affected, putting those. Um, safety, 
you know, safety procedures in so that the family unit is protected while certain family members go through their uh, addiction. Thank you. And what are your primary goals, aspirations? What do you want to work on and focus on in the upcoming uh, um, election cycle? Um, I, th I think one of the lessons that I've learned on this past term is how Maui is such a hotbed for outside investments. And so as, a, as small communities like ourselves, we just kind of provide, um, you know, the service in industry for, for these, these investors. So um, I think just, just having that IK, that knowledge, um, to direct my decision making, uh, like I said, I, I support the ESG concept. Uh, we should be looking our our pension fund is worth billions of dollars. Yet we invest outside of our uh, our communities and at world markets when we should be putting in, you know, for the beneficiaries, putting in monies towards, you know, our own sustainability. I think um, having our our public utility, our public resource, um, controlled by um, a foreign entity, having outside investors, um, uh, investing so much money where you know they're able to purchase even more. Um, so um, addressing that as far as the tax structure, um, and and. Just kind of getting more investments, more local investments, I guess. That would be one of my um, objectives. Just to put more obje uh, um, investing, investing into local hands. All right. Thank you. With that, I'll pass it on to the next. Uh, Tommy, that's you. Uh, are you ready? You, you have to unmute yourself, Tommy. Hi, I'm new. <clears throat> uh, hey, Shane, um, I'm going to get a little tougher here. I want to circle back to our unsheltered population uh, just a bit. Mm. Uh, Tommy, you're muted Tommy. again. You got yeah. muted. Yeah, you got muted, Tommy. Just unmute. I got Sorry it. about that. All right, let's start over. Hey, Shane, um, when COVID hit, a few things happened. Um, we were given stay-at-home orders by our mayor and our governor, and the CDC had recommendations across the board on how we were supposed to uh, proceed with many different safety concerns. One of the shelter-at-home, uh, shelter-in-place orders also applied to our unsheltered population. Um, mayor Victorino went on multiple announcements claiming that he was uh, uh, not moving homeless populations, yet at the same time, Chief of Police moved dozens of families out in the middle of the night. I was document th documenting them personally. Um, then the mayor also cut off water and closed parks, which is a deliberate impact on the unsheltered population. Now he's trying to get kudos for building uh, these prefabbed uh, uh, deals for, for the homeless population, but at the same time, they're not using a human first approach, meaning that if you have substance issues, then the housing's not for you. So mayor is consistently choosing um, uh, failed methods of uh, dealing with our homeless um, uh, and our unsheltered populations, uh, things that have been proven to not work over and over and over again. We've watched multiple administrations um, uh, botch this issue. I can tell you one thing that Kanaha is the only park that's still closed on the island and there's a reason for it. And there's a reason because, and there's a reason that the homeless population is at the Kanaha park. It's because our administration has pushed these people into this, uh, uh, up against the side. So my question is, are you or is anybody going to do anything extra than just kind of go with the flow? Yeah, uh, thank you, Tommy, for that uh, that question. Um, for us in East Maui, uh, you're right. We quickly went straight to the uh, the Parks Department and to our state legislatures and asked them to open up our parks, um, not just for our homeless population, but for our 
um, our kupuna that was that was traveling to to and from Hana. So we needed those bathrooms um, open for them. So um, it was a push, but we had to do that. Just I mean, out in our community, um, you know, people had to wash their hands too and use the bathroom and and not you know use the bathroom outside. So uh, uh, we thought that was a, um, a health hazard by doing that. Um, I, I can't speak to what the administration um, will do, but I, th I think with this influx of federal monies, I mean, if, if we don't use it to address this problem, what a, what a misuse of the money and a missed opportunity in addressing this really important issue. Um, um, I've asked for um, mobile units for, for East Maui as if we can use that for our, uh, um, use the CARES uh, funding for, for looking to mobile uh, homes for, for our unsheltered. So um, we'll push it as much as we can. Um, those money still would need have to, will still have to come through through us and so as much as we can direct as much money we can towards the unsheltered, we will. I will. Is there a risk at losing these funds if you guys don't act in a timely or an appropriate manner? Correct. Right yeah. You right, have so to what's up with that? By the end of, uh, of the year, December, uh, by December 2020, you have to use the funds. So um, there is an urgency to it. Uh, maybe that's why the mayor is using it to – build some shelters um but i think it's it's systemic um and so putting more monies into you know addressing the the core of the issue i think that will be as important to okay thank you Great. Um, uh, Tommy, uh, can we move on then? Are uh, you ready? Yeah. Okay. Robin, uh, could you go next? Okay. Um, so as was alluded to earlier, our state constitution um, tasks government at state and local level uh, with the public trust for our resources and our water um, especially. And that does include water quality, not just managing quantity of use, but also what are we doing to the quality. Um, and what I've noticed is that our county has a tendency to do more with managing quantity than they do managing quality. Um, one of the ideas that came up about how to resolve, you know, what happens with our injection wells and our wastewater treatment plants is to have a community working group. Uh, Mayor Tavares had done that at one point, but it was unfortunately a censored process. We couldn't talk about ocean water quality, but I think if we could repeat that without censorship, that our community has a lot to give in terms of helping to solve the problem. So is there a way uh, that the county government could form a wastewater working group and invite the public in to participate in the decision making? Uh, yes, that's definitely possible. Um, uh, we're working to to get uh, a, a water a water working group. Um, um, Member King is is working to have a climate action working group. So, um, and I, I think now that we're moving to to more remote and online uh, venues, um, I, I think that'll be a great you know great effort in connecting with with all of our communities so um it's definitely a, a possibility i don't know if wastewater would be uh, we have the wit committee so I, i'm not sure if that would take precedence but um you know looking at where um who would shepherd it um that would be that would be the main thing I think you hit the nail on the head of one of the issues that I have with how we manage water. And that is we have all these kind of silos. You know, this these people are in charge of infrastructure. These people are in charge of drinking water. These people are in charge of stormwater. And 
I'm not real clear on who's in charge of water quality. So in the industry of, you know, water, there, there is a concept of integrated water resource management where we don't divide the water up in our problem solving, but we see the interconnectedness of it. So um, what kind of ideas do you have about how we could better structure our government around how we take care of the water? Mm. Uh, we've been having, uh, the office have been receiving a lot of um, uh, calls of clean water, water solutions, those types of things. We're looking at it right now. I don't know if the, the industry is still at a small scale. Um, if the industry can come up with more uh, municipal size um, uh, products um, that could, you know, that could address, uh, you know, municipalities, I think um, we'd be open. Um, this is a great time to, to have those new industries um, come up and, and, and be considered, especially if a if a council is open to these um, to these new uh, new products, new industries, like we are. Uh, we've lost everyone's audio. I think. Okay. <laughs> Do you have any further questions, uh, Robin? No, that's all. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll have. One last question. Uh, uh, we've been at it for almost an hour now. So Shane, thank you for hanging in there with all these questions. Uh, Daniel, do you have a last question or someone else? If you want to raise your hand. Um, I'm feeling complete. I'll leave it uh, to okay. someone else. Great. Well, um, uh, I, I guess that means I don't see anyone raising their hands. So I, I would say that we're in pretty good shape. I have one more final question. Uh, and that has to do with the, um, that in 2016, the Charter Amendment to allow county council to obtain legal advice from a source not connected to the corporate council. Uh, what is your feeling about having a separate uh, legal council so that we can have ind independent decisions uh, from corporate council? Right. I agree. We're in a precarious situation where our corporation council represents the legislators and the administration. So um, we've been trying to use as much um, our um, uh, council services for, you know, additional input. Um, but I'm supportive, um, especially if you're right, if, if they're going to have um, uh, cannot be impartial in making decisions. Um, um, between the legislature and the administration. So um, I believe I, I supported um, uh, going through uh, having outside counsel. Great. Thank you for that. And, and Shane, thank you for uh, all you've been doing as you've stepped up. And uh, again, uh, you have been, uh, I think, in many ways, uh, as, we, as the questions and your answers indicate, that uh, there's been a lot of progressive support on your part and really looking at uh, these different issues. So mahalo for that, uh, Shane. And uh, with that, I'm just gonna take a little time then uh, to talk about your opponent. Uh, and uh, if we could uh, then end this part of our interview, uh, Shane. So thank you to have, so, uh, but I'd like you to end uh, though by talking a little bit about your uh, where people can reach you, your website, how people can donate, uh, and how they can connect with you if they have any specific questions. Uh, yeah, thank you. And again, thank you uh, for you guys' continued support. Uh, we're working on getting our uh, website up and running. We've got a, a WordPress um, at votesandnc.com. Um, uh, we're working on getting um, to receive any donations, but uh, in the interim, uh, you can always uh, support Friends of Shane Sinensi at P.O. Box 343 in Hana 96713.